what does this actually teach people? What are some examples of how drastic altering language could be on an individual? It's true. People generally have never heard of the sociolinguist. Today, my guest is Valerie Friedland, an esteemed professor of linguistics at the University of Nevada in Reno. Her captivating language blog has been found on Psychology Today. It's called Language in the Wild, where she delves into slang, accents, and grammar myth. What is the psychological reasoning why people swear? I don't study profanity myself. There seems to be sort of an emotional response that it's helping us process when we use profanity. When we swear, it seems to be something that helps us feel better. It's helping us express an emotion, an emotional reaction, just in the same way like it's encoding an emotion in the same way way that O is encoding of surprise. I'm just super curious when you listen to me, like, what does that say about me? And be ruthless. Okay. Like you can say whatever you want. One thing I did notice um, is, you know, men tend to think. Welcome to Success Story. I'm your host, Scott Clary. The Success Story podcast is part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Now, the HubSpot Podcast Network has incredible podcasts like My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Purry. They interview some of the most incredible business leaders, Alex Ramosi, Sophia Amoruso, Hassan Minhaj, who share their journey to success and how they made their first million. On a recent episode, they featured the acquired podcast hosts, Ben Gilbert and David Rosenthal, to discuss how they scaled their multi-million dollar podcast. Don't sleep on My First Million. If you want to get inspired, if you want to learn from the best, you got to tune in to My First Million wherever you listen to your podcast. Today, my guest is Valerie Friedland, an esteemed professor of linguistics at the University of Nevada in Reno. She holds a PhD in linguistics from Michigan State University. She specializes in sociolinguistics, American dialectology, and regional vowel variation. Her captivating language blog has been found on Psychology Today. It's called Language in the Wild, where she delves into slang, accents, and grammar myths. As a distinguished professor of the Great Courses series, she shares her passion for language with students worldwide. She's taught at a multitude of prestigious institutions, such as Georgetown, George Mason, and others. She's recognized for her innovative teaching methods and dedication to mentoring graduate students. She's an active member of professional organizations like the Linguistic Society of America, the American Dialect Society, and she also contributes as an editor or reviewer for renowned journals in her field. Well, I had parents that are non-native speakers, and I grew up in a small, well, it wasn't a small town um, at the time either, but it still felt small town in the South. And it really was very exotic to have parents that didn't speak with a Southern accent. And I remember when I'd have all these friends come over, and my mom is French speaking, and so she would say, Valérie, Valérie, to call me. And I, I every single friend, it was like, you know, all of a sudden they call to attention, and then they'd start imitating her you know, with her accent. And it really brought home to me how integral to our personalities, voices, how much having something that's different than somebody else from an accent perspective or whatever thing makes you different, makes you stand out in some way. And of course, you know, to a 10 year old, it wasn't a good thing. I hated that. I hated it when people, you know, I was like, mom, stop saying my name, just don't talk. But it really brought home to me the power of language in shaping social identity and the way that people perceive you. So I really found languages fascinating just in general because I think, you know, partially it was my parents didn't just speak English and that wasn't their first language. Also from that experience of having people react to their accents and think things about us, about us being kind of different or novel or not fitting in uh, because of the way they talked. So when I went to college at Georgetown University, I went into the languages and linguistics program, mainly just because I was curious about learning about more languages and more about how they worked. Uh, I didn't really have any concept of linguistics at the time. Um, in fact, I think if you told me as freshman year I would have been a linguist, I probably would have cried <laughs> because it sounds very boring uh, to a 19 year old. But I took a linguistics class that covered language and gender, uh, sort of all the different ways that our, our speech reveals who we are from a, mm -hmm. a sort of social and um, gender perspective and how that impacts how you're perceived. It impacts your opportunities in the office. It impacts your relationships. And it kind of blew my mind because it articulated all these things I had felt and noticed. So we all have these feelings about language when someone says something in a certain tone or they sort of tell us, dismiss us because of the way we talk. We all have had that experience in some way, shape or form. 
but we've never had the language to discuss it. We always thought of it as a sort of a, our us problem. And all of a sudden mm-hmm. I saw, oh my gosh, this isn't just me. People that remark on my slight Southern accent, it's not because I'm saying something wrong. It's because of these larger sociolinguistic forces that make us notice p- the way people talk. It makes us sort of predetermine who they are from a social perspective. And it really impacts the opportunities that people have down the road because of the way people think you are because of the way you talk. And it was that, that was really the turning point for me where I decided, oh, you know, screw Chinese, which was my major at the time. I want to go study linguistics. It was also that I was really bad at Chinese. That probably had something to do with it too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, this is so fascinating because le- I think anybody listening understands how important language is. And everybody who's listening has had these moments in their life when they've been judged or they've even judged someone else. But it doesn't seem like be- quite literally before I met you, I've never heard of somebody studying this as a profession. I I mean, I the only application that I can see this in day to day would be maybe actors and actresses and, and people that use this as part of their profession. But this is so language is so powerful. And it seems like the lack of understanding of language and how it impacts is, is something that could change people's careers, change people's lives, change their ability to negotiate the next job or present a certain way. And there's all these other skills that are are about are sort of uh, adjacent to communication mm-hmm. that people focus on, but they never focus on language. I've never heard somebody say like, don't say this word or say this word as part of, don't, you know, they say don't say um or whatnot and try and cut out the filler words when you're doing a presentation, maybe to be a bit more confident. But I've never seen somebody, and actually, apparently, according to your research, that's not even the best way to present. But the point is, <laughs> I've never seen somebody focus on this before. So what what does this impact what kind of impact does this study have what does this actually teach people what kind of uh influence could this have on somebody's life like what are some examples of how uh drastic altering language could be on an individual well you know it's interesting that you say that because it's true people generally have never heard of the sociolinguist or even a linguist that's a theoretical linguist like i am so we talk about linguists that study a lot of languages but the type of linguist that i am Mm -hmm. is someone who studies the underlying structure of language how we produce sounds why certain things happen a certain way how languages change over time what Uh, is the what are the social and linguistic forces that create the language we speak why did old English uh, sound so different than modern English all those kinds of things and and we also try to trace back the evolution of where all languages come from did they were they from one language one proto language or was it sort of multi multiple origin stories for language so those are all those big questions that we don't think about as speakers of a language we think about what's a noun what's a verb and you know where's my mm-hmm. dangling modifier Uh, And those are really interesting because those are actually social preferences that we have learned when we study English language arts. What we're studying is one person's version of what they like about language and what they have claimed language should be. Those are not the actual cognitive rules that create language and drive it forward. Um, So it's really kind of striking to me that we don't know this side of language because it's so pivotal in everything we do. I mean, do you have a voice assistant, like a, a virtual assistant that you talk to, Alexa or yeah. Siri? Linguist, linguist, yeah, linguist, yeah. right? If it wasn't for people like me, you wouldn't be able to talk to them. So someone has to figure out how to program those computers to understand human speech. What is the structure of a sentence so that we make sure that when Siri spits something out, she follows that structure, right? It's an analysis. I mean, she's using large data pools. So she's doing analysis that is a syntactic analysis of those speech features. So this predictive language model that is driving like chat GPT today What it does is it looks at huge quantities of of language data. A lot of them have been um, pruned and approved by linguists. Like this is something, the types of language data we want. A lot of the language data comes from linguists. In fact, I have a friend that runs a large corpus that is a linguist and a lot of his, um, lately, a lot of his work is trying to field requests from these large language data runners to get his access to his corpora to help them build language models for these big chat GPT type things. So that chat GPT is a predictive model, meaning that based on its analysis, its sort of linguistic analysis of all these sets of data, it predicts what comes next. So if you have a sentence, it's looking at 
massive quantities of data and saying, what is the t statistical probability that this type of word comes next? And this is exactly what you do as a human language model, right? You are predicting, when you hear someone talk, you are predicting, oh, they said the, nouns follow the, mm. that's probably gonna be a noun. And that's how I understand if you use a word that's not typically a noun and put it after a the, all of a sudden it becomes a noun because my brain understands that the makes things a noun, that that, that slot in syntactic structure makes it a noun. So another great example is um, adulting, right? That we've made into yeah, a verb, yeah. right? People of course hate that, but uh, what they don't know is parent and parenting is actually the same relationship. Parent, the noun came centuries before we started talking about parenting. So you could be a parent in the 14th century, but you didn't do parenting. And really the first reference to parenting we find is in the 16th century. And then it was hardly ever used until the 20th century. But parent has been used for a long time. Well, adult, adulting has that exact same distribution where adult came first and it meant to be a grown up, right? A grown up person. But adulting carries with it, not just the idea of I'm being, I'm grown up, it carries, all the things associated socioculturally with being an adult. And it's by adding that ing that it signals to me, okay, I've shifted that noun to a verb. So these are actually linguistic ways of looking at language that are super helpful in both, you know, data for language learning models in making sure Siri recognizes a Southern accent versus a non-Southern accent yeah. by giving it the understanding of the vowels, for example, that a Southern uses versus a non-Southerner. It's also really important in um, educational contexts because a lot of times we have non-native or non-standard speakers. I, both of those go to schools along with native and standard speakers and we can have some problems in terms of how educational attainment is met for different pools of language learners or different pools of dialect speakers. And it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with those dialects, but we can use the models of standard English and the models of dialects that are non-standard to try to compare them to help children achieve learning attainment by giving them really solid understandings of where their dialect differs from the one that is the socially preferred dialect. Now notice I said socially preferred because there's nothing wrong with a standard, Correct, standard yeah. dialect, it's simply a different set of rules. But how do you learn rules? You learn it by having them articulated. In English language arts, we don't articulate, here's the rule where English you know, uses a noun after a the. Here, we don't articulate those kinds of rules. We give people ideas like nouns are person, places, or things, which actually doesn't explain most nouns, right? Especially abstract ones. That's not really linguistics. That's actually just sort of ideas about language that get floated around. So there are lots of ways that linguists are relevant to our daily lives. Um, in professional circles, linguists do a lot of things like studies on, at that, as well as communication researchers, studies on how mm -hmm. different types of language use is perceived in different contexts. So one place, for example, that I give talks on a lot is accent discrimination and how what kind of work research linguists do can show us where we're making some errors in the way that we approach accents in workplaces. Um, and sometimes it's really surprising. So for example, if you see, if we do experiments where we see an Asian face, a South Asian face, and we play a standard English native speaker uh, voice, and then we compare that to a different control group that saw a white face with this, the same exact voice. What we find is ratings of intelligibility and ratings of non-nativeness go significantly up when you show them a picture of a non-white person, which means you're not actually hmm. listening to the actual signal because it's exactly the same voice, but just your stereotypes about what that person should sound like influences strongly what you think they sound like and can affect intelligibility. But what we find is people that and are- that's a massive bias a massive when it comes to bias. like hiring and whatnot. Right, but, and then what's yeah. the solution? That's the other thing. So what we find in, in also doing the same studies is if we expose speakers to more talkers from diverse backgrounds, they get better at not processing it in a negative way. Um, so it can uh, decrease accent bias. So there are a lot of different places where linguists are important and people just don't realize they are. No, I, I, I have no doubt they're very important. <laughs> I think that more people should be aware, more people should be aware of, of their, of their biases that they assume when they, when they, when they hear someone and when they receive a message. But, um, it's, it's, 
like with without the education and the awareness, uh, like you said, like just like a, a, a random study is going to show this is a very real thing in, in the workplace, in a professional setting. You're you're trying to get a job. You're trying to raise money. This is going to be uh, this is going to be difficult if the person who's receiving it is not aware of these biases. But um, the other question would be so outside of the the person who's receiving the message being aware of these biases and 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 being exposed to a you know different different individuals so these biases start to be reduced is I, that's sort of what i'm hearing that if the person speaks to a whole bunch of different types of individuals eventually over time these types of biases are reduced are there ty- are there um n- what was the word you used you said uh, non uh, uh, like the preferred language, not the preferred language, like the, um, the socially accepted language. Are the outside of that realm, um, are there uh, like language quirks or things that people say that they should not say? It's not a bias. It's just like a like a bad habit or a bad practice that, that hurts. Uh, you know, I think that's a really loaded question because I'm a linguist. So my okay. aim is to <laughs> s- is study language descriptively. So what do people actually do? And then I can also look at the impact of, yes. of what they do. Uh, I particularly am interested in why they do it and where it came from. So what what need in our speech did it develop to to serve? Um, and that's sort of a prescriptive question in the sense of, is there anything we shouldn't do? But again, that all comes down to social preferences. And um, I'm not saying that there shouldn't Correct. be things that we watch in our speech because we know how other per- other people perceive it. And we obviously want to make a good impression. For example, a job interview, you probably don't want to walk in there saying a lot of ums and uhs, a lot of likes and use vocal fry. If you want to be employed by someone who might have a bias against those kinds of features. But in many ways, I would say that actually says a lot more about that company and the kind of climate it has that you probably don't want to be mm-hmm. a part of if they're going to have those kinds of biases against speakers that happen to typically be young and female because those are features that women, young women, tend to use at a higher rate. Um, so, you know, I think there's a difference between being aware of how you might be perceived based on using certain features um, versus the prohibition to not use them. If you look at young speakers, young speakers in general use those features. So if you're aging up those features, then any workplace would be, uh, you know, sort of dumb to ignore them because that is the latest in the clients and the employees they are going to have. Um, So when we so when we look at language and like our language choices, forget bias, but just our personal language choices, what does that say about our, our identity and our personality and our social relationships? An enormous amount. And I think that's the thing that people tend not to realize. Um, You know, we see language in two ways, either good language or bad language. And if you speak good language, you're a good person. If you speak bad language, there's something wrong with you. Um, But in reality, language is about social identity just as much as it's about communication. So think about, you know, things like, hi, how you doing? That we say five million times a day. Uh, they're they're really about making connection, right? It's there's nothing informational in that other than hey, I like you, I just want to check on you, and let's have some connection here. Let's build a relationship. So it's relationship building. So a lot of times language is about talking in such a way that it invites connection, camaraderie, solidarity, and closeness. Or it, it tells someone the way that you're approaching them. Um, so I you know. You, we were talking before we went on about how you can change your speech over time as you become more informal and more casual and that you've heard podcasters do that sort of over a couple of years. Well, the idea with mm-hmm. more casual, informal speech is it's inviting. When you, when you go home and you used an overly formal way of approaching your family, they're going to look at you like, what the hell is going on with you? Because who are you? You know, it, because it's weird. It's not, it doesn't speak to your relationship. So when you are in a conversation that with someone you just met, for example, and you sort of get that sense that you like them, that you're making a connection, do you stay stiff and formal in your speech or do you switch and start using maybe more contractions like gonna wanna have to? Do you start saying, you know, I always switch. gonna instead yeah. of will? Do you say things like yeah. walking instead of walking? Those are very subtle cues that we give each other about the relationship. So if you've ever been in a conversation where someone does not shift, it's very off-putting. In fact, you probably walk away with a bad impression about them. And that's the same thing as using things like discourse markers. Well, oh, so, like, you know, 
those are about connection. And actually, if you look at research on them, we find that when people take personality tests, more conscientious speakers tend to use more discourse markers. So it's actually the linguistic version of kindness when you think about discourse markers. So our dislike of them is really more about who has tended to use them historically more. So women tend to use more discourse markers and it's probably a lot with women's speech is related to the position and the role that they've had um, compared to men for centuries. And women's voices have always been um, sort of vilified and um, told to be silent for, you know, since Aristotle. Uh, I think Aristotle had a saying that said, uh, silence gives grace to woman so you know that sort of tells you what, what he thought about women's voices in the public sphere and then you know we used to put them in uh, scolds bridles in the middle ages if they talked too much and said things that we thought was blasphemy which was mainly saying you know he he sucks we should get rid of this guy or you know talking around yeah. the your gossip circles and the water well that you had these feelings about maybe those in governance or people that were doing things you didn't like well that was dangerous especially when women were saying it because women talked to a lot of other women and they talked to their husbands and then it could spread like wildfire. It was kind of the internet, you know, the gossip circles were the internet of the middle ages. And so they actually would uh, prosecute women for sins of the tongue and put them in things called wow. scolds bridles, which was like a metal Hannibal Lecter contraption that held their tongue down so that they couldn't speak. So here's this history. And so we have always then been skeptical of women's voices. So that leads us to believe, A, women talk more than men, which they don't. Most research doesn't show that to be true. Women um, have less to say. It's unimportant. It's vacuous. It's empty headed. So that then gets assigned to the features they tend to use at a higher rate. So things like like or vocal fry, or using a lot of intensifiers like very or so, or pretty or really, those tend to be used at a higher rate in women's speech. And the reason for that is that women actually lead in language change and have through time. So almost everything that you say today as a man was something that was started with a woman centuries ago. Uh, so it's, really? it's very interesting that so, women are very powerful progenitors so, of change. Can I sure. ask something? So if historically women's voices were suppressed, how was it so that even though they were suppressed, the uh, the the items in their speech were actually setting um, like the the precedent for how men speak in the future in in the next you know couple of years or the next the next um, uh, uh, the next uh, uh, the, the, you know the next ten years right. uh, men will sort of adopt some of these speaking patterns. How did that? How did that happen? Well, I mean, of course, the big answer is women are just cooler. So, of course, everybody goes after what they say. But the real answer, I mean, we are cool, but <laughs> the real answer is what is what is a role of a woman historically? So they are often the homemakers. They raise the children. Mm -hmm. They are talking to their husbands when they get home. So we have this really interesting thing called intimate diversification, which is a big fancy word to say that unlike other subcultures, that tend to be segregated. So if you look in a lot of cities, you'll find segregated ethnic enclaves so that you have these different sort of backgrounds and different language choices perhaps, but they tend to be relegated to very distinct enclaves a lot of times because of historical power differences and socioeconomic differences, but whatever the reasons, they're kept separate. So there's not as much borrowing across ethnic groups for features, except of course now there's a huge amount of borrowing of African-American features from like black Twitter and hip hop into white male speech. So that's a totally different thing, but women raise the children. So children tend to adopt initially, at least until they mm. go undergo vernacular reorganization in school, they adopt the features of guess who? Their moms. The mother. Their moms. Yeah. So, you know, unless that changes drastically, and of course it has changed somewhat, it's still the case that that happens. So what we find is women are usually a generation ahead of men in picking up a, fe a speech feature. Now, this is not all features. There are. This is when you were asked that question about what does our language say about us. It says a lot, a lot, so much. It's hard to get to it all. We could talk yeah. for hours, but essentially, in the majority of speech features that have become standard over time gone from being sort of less standard or just not noticed to being standard, it is women that have led in those changes. They lead by usually at least one generation because when they have children, 
those children inherit their speech. So boys and girls inherit the system of the mother first and foremost, and then they go to school and they start reorganizing their speech. We call it vernacular reorganization to be more like their peers. And then they pick up new forms and fashions in speech. And that is what we dislike as adults, right? This difference in our speech and the children's speech, because it says something like this is youth culture and this is adult culture. It makes us feel old. And we tend to label what they do as sort of novel and um, undesirable. But in fact, a lot of it does end up staying around and becoming the norms of the next generation. But it's women more than men that in the teen years push language forward. So then we have this sort of leapfrog where, okay, women were a generation ahead. They had children. The kids inherited their generation. They go to school or their speech. They go to school with the same system, but then girls forge ahead another generation. If a change is is going to continue, the girls will push it forward and then they give it to their children. So you have this kind of leapfrog pattern that men stay a generation behind until that change has moved to completion, meaning that it's sort of what everybody says and it's so so widespread that there's no more leapfrogging and that's when we find that men catch up and that's when a new norm gets established over time um, and so a great example uh, historically would be because uh, sometimes it's easier if you have an example uh, when you say you know he does instead of he doth that was actually a change led by women so we find in letters of course we don't have recordings back from back then but in the early modern period which was about 1500 to 1700 we find letters written by women and we also tend to find letters written by less educated uh, people as well that sort of also gives us the sense that these weren't really standard features in fact it was a northern feature a northern british feature and it was finally adopted into london speech which is when it became the standard but we find does starting to appear instead of doth first in women's and less educated speakers letters uh, and then about, you know, another generation skips forward and we start to see it in men's speech. So that's sort of what incrementally pushes change forward. Now, sometimes, of course, a feature gets very gendered. So little boys go to school and then they hear girls say it and it takes on this very feminine tone. They get a very gendered association with that, sort of like totally as an intensifier. Yeah. Um, and so they retreat and that's where you find that changes tend not to progress or they become very gendered changes over time where only women do them to a high degree and men don't. And we find the opposite is true as well. Sometimes features become gendered towards men and women don't do it as much. Um, so, you know, what we... I just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, HubSpot. Now, companies are under pressure right now. Pressure to get more leads, close deals faster, get better insights to create the best experience for their customers. See, a CRM can help, but not just any CRM. One that is easy to set up, intuitive to use, and customizable to the way you do business. Now that's where HubSpot comes in. HubSpot CRM is an easy for everyone to use on day one solution. It helps teams be more productive. You can drag and drop your way to attention grabbing emails and landing pages. You can set up marketing automation to give every contact the white glove treatment plus AI-powered tools like Content Assistant mean less time spent on tedious manual tasks and more time for what matters, your customers. HubSpot CRM has all the tools you need to wow prospects, lock in deals, and improve customer service response times. Get started today for free at HubSpot.com. And what would cause that? What would cause the totally to, to be a more gendered feature? Um, well, a lot of times it's the different types of attract of sociocultural attractiveness that features carry. So um, what makes a boy popular in school? You know, you, you were a boy, uh, right? You traditionally went to school. sports. Okay. Yeah. Like playing sports, having friends, you know. Being kind of tough and macho, right? Sort of yeah, having like, yeah, bravado, basically, yeah. that kind of thing. And does yeah. that is that the same kind of thing that happens for women when a girl i mean they can play sports but it's sort of masculine bravado uh very popular. no traditionally no no, no it's really not, not femininity no. and more totally sort of, 180 right that, yeah so think about the types of features that boys tend to use um you know like man and bro and dude are good examples mm -hmm. of that that it sort of is a masculine solidarity tough kind of guy or just the um appropriation of hip-hop language you know yeah. that type of thing saying things like ain't Generally, women yeah. as young girls get um, vilified for their speech much more than boys do. So if a girl comes home and says, I ain't doing that, that have parents that have an expectation about what that girl should sound like, she's going to get ridiculed for it. 
much more than a boy would because for a boy we kind of have this expectation of rough tough kind of behavior and so features that embody that kind of roughness that toughness that masculine kind of quality those are the types that boys tend to pick up which is why they tend to be very attracted to non-standard features because we have these stereotypes about what those speakers are like even though they're completely cultural artifacts like the idea that young black men are dangerous and rebellious and nonconformist well that's that's our interpretation of a speech feature that has nothing to do with the reality of why a young black man uses it right because a young black man might use a speech feature like thang or ain't or ain't or axe because he's yeah. he's trying for solidarity with a group of other speakers who have faced the same sort of social cultural prejudice as he has and and he has to have that that's part of what bonds them is having a shared language and it's it's actually ax is an older feature than ask and that's what ask came from which is so a, it, another thing but that's wild so, so you're crazy. saying like people no I just, I just wanted to understand so that means that one group of individuals have completely adopted a, a language uh, I'm going to just very, very simplify this so I understand it. One group of individuals have, have adopted certain things in their language because of a certain social cultural norm. Mm -hmm. And then another group has misinterpreted that social cultural norm and then adopted things because of that misinterpretation. And then that's been brought up. Uh, that's so that, exactly that's right. really what's happening. That's happening. exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens. And the reason that ethnic features tend to be so popular among young men. So if you go to high school, I have a teenage son. And um, so I'm, I'm, uh, and he plays a lot of sports. So I'm around a lot of boys a lot of times. And sometimes it makes me laugh the way they talk because I want to say, do you realize what you're doing? You know, but they would totally ignore me and, and my son would never invite me to another game. So not going to do it. <laughs> but what, what they don't understand is the reason those features are attracted attractive to them is because they're completely misinterpreting why they're used in the first place. Um, they are used as sort of symbolic, symbolic, solidarity symbols for the groups that use them in the same way that we use certain features um, like like or uh, vocal fry to lay claim to other aspects of our identity and those tend to be very predominantly kind of white and middle class features um, and actually if you look at um and i use which we should talk about at one point because it will blow your mind yeah, but we will. if you look at the distribution of use of those features men use a uh, much more than women do and upper class speakers tend to use more filled pauses than lower class speakers. Um, so they sort of, it's funny how these different features take on these associations that are very subtle. We don't realize it, but they send messages to us about who those people are because of the very, very detailed distribution of those features in speech that we can't articulate unless we're a linguist, but influence us nonetheless. So when we see higher rates of certain things like um, contractions or palatalization, which is when you say things like, um, want ya, did ya? Mm -hmm. That's called palatalization because it's simply two sounds coming together because of how they're articulated in the mouth that get palatalized, meaning the tongue moves more towards the palate. We find higher rates of that speech feature. Everybody does them, but we find higher rates in, among non-standard English speakers Probably because it is used as a language of, of communication, of intimacy, of connection. So when we shift to more informal features among our family members, it's because we're showing them that we're connected and we identify with them. So in communities that tend to have that as, be, as a very, very important facet of self-protection against a larger dominant culture that tends to despise them, that's a way to show it is in your language is connection. Um, so, but... The problem is a lot of times young men misinterpret those sort of signs of solidarity as also representing what those people represent to them from cultural stereotype, which is sort of dangerous and edgy and cool. And then to get that in their own persona, they adopt those features. So that's sort of how that cycle works. It's pretty fascinating. And and are there any other examples of, of because we we, now we've sort of spoken how language impacts society and a little bit of how society impacts language but outside of north america what are some other interesting examples of how society impacts language because it seems to be this like yin and yang seesaw type relationship between language and society that goes back and forth and they almost impact each other constantly 
Right. And so that's a really good question. And there are, I mean, language, this is how language operates everywhere. So there are linguists like me that study languages outside of English. I'm an English linguist, which means mainly what I study is in English. But what's really fascinating is how these patterns that I've just discussed are not patterns that are somehow naturally driven. So they're nothing biological. They, they have nothing to do with the fact that you're born female or you're born male. They have everything to do with the way that society expects you to act because of those designations. So, and that access and to resources that you have as a member of that society. So uh, we find in American English that women tend overall to use more standard forms of speech. And that's cuts across sort of ethnic and class lines. If you look across those groups in every group and you study the same feature that's non-standard, you typically find that men use non-standard features at a higher rate. Um, and so th this is things like um, simple things like walking versus walk in, you know, that alternation in the progressive participle. Um, we find in, in every group that studied that's a, an English speaker that men use a higher rate of in than ing. And women use typically a lower rate. That doesn't mean that every single woman follows that pattern, but the overall generalization that we find very, very consistently, and this is in world, world English, is not just American English, is that men use more in and women use more ing because ing is considered the more correct version and in is the more casual mm -hmm. sort of laid back version um, that we find that distribution. But part of that is because women in this culture are valued for being standard speakers. And a lot of times, historically and ecologically, they're given jobs in which language is very important. So think about teachers. Historically, teachers have been more women than men. And that, of course, is an area where language is important. So the way you speak to students is going to necessarily be more standard than the way you'd speak if you were, say, at a factory, which have typically been male-oriented mm -hmm. jobs. And what kind of speech is valuable at a factory? Well, you, it doesn't matter what progressive participle you use. It's that you have this sort of language that helps you kind of bond with the other people that are doing this boring job. Or a lot of cases that um, will help you communicate if there's any kind of danger. So in, in a lot of types of jobs that men historically have held, there might be high rates of danger. Factory work, it could be equipment. Uh, in, in lumber, it could be that a tree is falling, right? In firefighting, mm -hmm. it might be that there's a fire coming. So there's all these different pressures on you, but very few of them are speak standardly, right? It's like, hey, get out of the way of that damn tree, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. right, these pressures it's, are different. It's just like because of yeah. how we treat men and women in this culture in terms of the jobs that we expect them to have. Another job that women have historically done more is being the front line of restaurants, of banks, of hotels, of service industries. And that, again, puts a pressure on women to have more standard speech um, versus being in a police force or something like that. How many policemen really worry about having standard speech? Not much, because, again, it's a language of solidarity. Um, and brotherhood, right? But you go to a yeah. different country, like is perhaps in the Middle East, where there's different norms for behavior for men and women, where men are out in professions and women are not. Women have to rely on solidarity and friendship among other women primarily. They don't need to have any kind of outward facing good speech. We find the exact opposite pattern. In those cultures, men lead in the use of standard forms and women lead mm. in the use of non-standard features. So we find the same pattern, but for the same reasons, but sometimes it's reversed based on the social needs of that society. Now, what? so then what does this mean for an increasingly globalized world? Because now we're, we're working remote, working from home on Zoom with people from every single country every single day. And I would, I would assume that most people don't understand the level of detail that one should understand to communicate with an individual in a different society or a different culture or a different part of the world. Right. So what does this actually mean? Well, you know, I think, and that's sort of what I'm trying to get, my main message of the book, in addition to being fun and learning about these fascinating facts, because there's so many unbelievable facts about language we don't understand, and we have these beliefs that they come from these weird places that they don't come from, or they spontaneously come into existence and they're just bad. Um, almost everything we do has been around for centuries and there's a reason we do it. And one thing that I think is my main message of the book is be compassionate, right? Think about the fact that not everybody comes to language with the same perspective that you do. 
Um, and the reason they're doing the things they do is because that has been useful in their own background, in their own language, in their own existence. Mm -hmm. And you are falling on the same exact pattern for the same exact reason. So compassion is really key, especially in this new connected world. Um, there are also a number of different things that if we understand the linguistics behind it, it'll make it a little easier in things like Zoom. I mean, Zoom is a weird context because first of all, it has a, a delay. There's a sort of an internet yeah. delay. So that it kind of, there's been a really fascinating study recently that looked at the way that we cognitive process, we sort of process cognitively the interactions that we have when we talk to people. And we do this thing called like syncing. So when we're having a conversation in real time with someone in a real place, you know, a one-on-one -on -one real, real conversation in physical space, their, our brains sync up um, and they sort of are able to sort of attach to the pattern and the, pa the stress pattern and the intonation pattern of that other person and kind of know when we're going to hop in and when we're not. And our brain doesn't have to do that much work because it, they're synced. So it's not exhausting. How many times have you had a Zoom conversation and you're really tired at the end and you can't figure out why? Yeah. It's because your brains can't sync to the same way. Because of that lag, that slight lag throws off our automatic syncing and it makes us have to work harder to process what other people say and then to jump in and follow up with it. So one thing to remember is that tiredness is actually real physical tiredness from doing heavy cognitive work. And it's not only you, it's everybody else on that phone call. So one thing is to think about, well, how, what does that mean for me as a employer or as a manager, as a participant in these things? Are there things we're doing on Zoom that could be better done elsewhere through other forums, either email, something that's the asynchronous perhaps, or through mm -hmm. a phone call that we don't seem to have that same kind of exhaustion when we talk, that maybe we should save the Zoom for things that we can devote full energy to for a shorter period of time. Uh, so, so one thing is to think about don't have these you know five hour Zoom meetings uh, or take breaks so that you let people's brains kind of have a chance to relax and get over it. The other thing is who am I talking to in terms of what culture they're from and how do they deal with silence? because different cultures have different norms for how long a lag to have between different conversational terms. And American English speakers don't like having much time at all. So we don't like to leave silence out there on the table. But for example, Finns and Japanese speakers tend to have much longer silence that's acceptable and desirable. So of course to them on a phone call, on a Zoom call or a phone call with an American English speaker, the American English speaker is constantly talking, jump interruptions, jumping in all the time and basically hogging the conversational floor. To an English speaker, American English speaker, a Japanese or Finn is never talking, they're uninterested, they're not holding up their end of the conversation. So can you see how this one really simple difference mm -hmm. in our cultural norms for talking can create some significant problems from a business perspective. I love that. That's fascinating. Okay. I want to actually, cause we actually haven't spoken about like your book at all. No. We've done... <laughs> There's so much <laughs> fun actually... stuff to cover. There's a lot. This is amazing. Okay. I, I will, I, I will go into the book. I'm just super curious. Um, when you, when you listen to me, like, what does that say about me? I, I'm, I want you to like, to I want you to speech. give me like the rundown on, on, on how I speak and how I present. It's, it's so good and, and be ruthless. Okay. Like you can say whatever you want. Well, just to preface this by when a linguist studies speech, what we do is we actually record a bunch of speakers and then we analyze their speech, usually using acoustic equipment. And then so we can pull out statistical distribution. So I don't usually just sort of take okay. it on one person because speech it's usually a, a glom no, an right. agglomeration. But that said, um, I actually, now it's interesting because I had listened to you do a podcast before I came on. I always like to listen. And one thing I did notice um, is, you know, men tend to think they don't ever use like in their speech. And one mm -hmm. thing I did notice is you are a quoted of like per speaker. You don't tend to use like in other contexts, but I did hear you actually use quoted of like, which is not surprising because it's the probably the fastest expanding use of like among um, Americans and Canadians. The study actually that showed an exponential use of quoted of like over 50% over 10 years of greater like use among young men and women in particular. So I had noticed that you, when you talk about what someone should say, you'll say, well, they, so they, if they were like this, if they, if they, you don't, you don't say, if they said X, you say, if, well, if they were like 
this, which tells me yeah. that you're under 40, most likely, because yeah. it is a youthful marker, especially quotative like. Um, a lot of people use discourse marker like, especially older you know, women, you'll find middle aged women that use it. But for quotative like, for a man to use it, it's usually a young male feature, a younger male, not, not you know, a teenager, <laughs> but teenagers do it too. But I did notice that in your speech. And then you have a really interesting uh, vowel raising in about that, about. Yeah, that's Canadian. Yes. And so I was wondering if you were Canadian based on that. I am. I'm from, yeah, yeah. I'm born in Toronto. Okay. So yeah. that's actually called yeah. Canadian raising. Um, and <laughs> that's sort of a stereotypical Canadian feature is Canadian raising. Now, people usually have it wrong. They th think people say a boot, which they don't, right? They say it very subtly, and you have a very subtle Canadian raising in your speech. Um, so I love that. that. Anyway, that's my quick and dirty acoustic ana or analysis <laughs> of your speech. No, that's amazing. Um, and it's, it's quite funny because... A lot of people, when they find it on Canadian, they don't, they don't, they don't hear any, I guess, uh, Canadian uh, in air quotes in my in my accent. But sometimes they have mentioned, oh, I hear it when you say about. Yes, yes. But it's only when I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> Just like like there. And how do you say exactly? Say, yeah. say this one word because this can also be Canadian, but it's it's. Yeah. I think it's older Canadian feature, so you may not have it. How do you say the word S O R R Y? Sorry. Oh, hey, so that's very Canadian. You say sorry. Sorry, yeah. What? How do you say? How? How would an American? Sorry. Sorry. Uh -huh, sorry. Well, that sounds weird yeah, to me. But you say sorry. That sounds so that's off. That's a to very me. Canadian yeah. feature. It's it's some that if you have a lot of contact with Americans, we notice that actually younger speakers can have it dissipating. But it's a tr it's a very traditional uh, Canadian feature to say sorry. That's so funny. Um, okay, let's talk about your book. So. The book is like literally dude arguing for the good and bad English. What what is the argument for the good and bad English? What does that mean? Well, so the idea here is sort of what we were talking about before that we have all these preconceived notions when we go into a speaking context about what yeah. good English is and if someone deviates from those norms that we expect them to use, we think all sorts of things about them. Um, and so a lot of times that's things that are not in our own speech, we judge other people, or we feel very self-conscious about those things in our, our speech because we know we do them and we know other people don't like them. Uh, and we have these ideas based on this very prescriptivist view of language that we've been taught since we've been, you know, born. Basically, our parents tell us, oh, don't say that. It's not, it's not him and I went to the store. It's, it's he and I, right? Those kinds of things that are very prescriptivist notions um, mm -hmm. that have developed over time. What we don't realize is those are only moments, right? Those are moments in our speech that we call attention to that over the long haul of language have made no difference. So these prescriptivist views, first of all, have only been around since about the 18th century. Before that, we really didn't have a lot of prescription, like you should do this, you should do that, you shouldn't do this, talk like this, don't talk like that. Um, that didn't mean we didn't notice differences in people's speech, but we didn't tell them they were bad speakers because of it in the way that we do now. But these are actually based on misunderstandings of where these features come from. Instead of realizing that they're actually part of the natural evolution of language, and we have done the exact same thing throughout history with things that we think are totally right now. Um, but it's also that we don't recognize that speakers do that for very, very good social reasons as well. Like people don't adopt our own, our speech because they want something that they're getting from using those other speech features. And it's that kind of social pressure that has moved language forward since the time of old English. Because if you've ever read Beowulf, I think you'll probably agree mm -hmm. with me that A, Beowulf is unintelligible to anybody that speaks English today, and B, it wasn't really fun to read, right? So no one No, wants it was brutal, to go. and I remember that too. I was like, why are we yes, still studying why, this? Yes, why the hell are we studying this? Like, who's gonna ever need this in life? Uh, and probably you don't, till you meet a linguist, but the reality yeah. <laughs> is, was that great English? No, but if we have, if we follow this view that older features are better features, then modern English speakers have a lot of explaining to do because clearly we have massively changed our language in the last thousand years. And in fact, the changes to English between the year 10,000, I mean, sorry, the year 1000 and the year 1700, basically, were much more major 
in terms of radically reshaping the way that English sounded and looked like than any changes that have happened in the years since prescription started. So we're actually really slowing the rate of change now, not speeding it up, but people act like we're decaying language constantly. So this book was just what like, was the what reason? are all these features? Just before you sorry. keep going. No, no, sorry. Before you keep going, what was the reason for that expedited change? Uh, well, in wars, period? invasions, the French, the Vikings, oh, okay. right? Uh, ma okay. Massive differences. All of that. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, in the 8th and 9th century, we had a lot of uh, Old Norse incursions, which basically was Viking incursions. Well, what we don't tend to think of is Vikings were actually not that different than what Anglo-Saxons were. Anglo-Saxons were essentially Vikings of an earlier era. They all were from the great Northern Germanic plains. And so they all spoke a kind of related, they all spoke dialects of essentially the same Germanic based language. Um, Anglo-Saxons came over several centuries before and then the language started to evolve in certain ways because those speakers were isolated, especially back then when you didn't you know, just pick up the phone or jump on Zoom. You didn't have a lot of contact. So languages naturally evolved due to underlying linguistic pressures in different directions whenever speakers are separated. And this can be separated by geography or separated by social distance, whatever. Um, so then when the Vikings started to come over, they spoke Old Norse, which was a similar dialect basically of the language the Anglo-Saxons spoke and people think of the Vikings as sort of these vicious people that came over and killed everybody but actually and they were I mean I'm not saying the Vikings were not fabulous and did only fabulous things they were mean and they killed a lot of people and you know they pillaged and all that but they also settled a lot in the Anglo-Saxon territory especially in the northern area of Britain and so they had a lot of assimilation with the Anglo-Saxons. And so Old Norse, because it's a dialect, whenever you have two dialects that are close together come in contact, they influence each other quite a bit because those speakers can communicate. So what happens is sort of a leveling where they kind of get rid of distinctive features and they move towards each other. They become more similar. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Old Norse features came into the language through Viking contact. Um, and so like that S, that S I told you that does, that's actually through Old Norse contact. It was a Northern feature that came to us from Old Norse contact. Um, and then a lot of things we noticed in American English, so Southern features like Mike could, saying things like Mike could, those are actually come yeah. from contact with Scots Irish back in the early days of colonial settlement. Um, so those are, all, again, very similar dialects to other ones that were sort of like the Virginia colonies spoke, right? They were from mainly south, southeastern British um, areas. Then you have the Scots-Irish that also were in contact. And so those those dialects bled together. The, the history of our language in American English is very similar. It's just all through contact. And then, of course, you have the Norman invasion. They brought the French over. And I, I do talk about this history in the book. And of course, French was the language of government for and of the royal court for hundreds of years. And what happens when you elevate a language? It becomes the powerful language. It's the one everybody wants to know if they want to work in that area, if they want to have social status of a certain type. Those that don't speak it by default become colloquial vernacular speakers that we kind of, you know, those are scuzzy people. We don't want to yeah. talk to them. Well, that was what English was. English was the scuzzy language. Right. You didn't get educated in English. You didn't make laws in English. You didn't have religious ceremonies in English because English was considered a sort of gross, vulgar language. It was the language of common people. I mean, that is what English That's is. Right. So the French, yeah. though, we borrowed a ton of vocabulary. We got new sounds. So, for example, um, F and V didn't exist in English as separate sounds until contact with the French, which is why we have that weird spelling in word, words like knife and knives and mm. wife and wives that's actually from this contact with french that gave us these two different sounds that we actually now treat differently which we didn't in old english so massive changes to the language over time and then in the early modern period the drastic change was that english rose up as the language of power and then that massively changed english because it started to be used in government it started to be used in education it started to be used in law it started to be used in the court which then elevated forms of english to be the standard over the things that had been associated with french so all of those were pretty massive changes and according to you know modern times we really haven't had that much excitement um, so not much has happened in english in the last 200 years compared to all those massive changes at that time Let's speak about um, some of those filled pauses that you were speaking about previously, mm -hmm. the ums and the uhs. So 
I even made a point at the beginning that that was the one thing that I, I don't know anything about linguistics, but I do know that I was not supposed to, when presenting, fill things with ums and ahs. And I know that when you record a podcast in post-production, if you do the editing, that's the parts that you're cutting out to make sure that it flows quicker. So what are those? Where do they come from? Why do we do them? What purpose do they have in our communication? Well, and that, what's so funny is so many people have told me, I cut every uh and um out of my recordings. Because yeah. that is a widespread belief. I mean, no one has ever gone to a public speaking class and been told, no, stick your ums in. They're awesome. No one ever. Zero. But that means no one has read the literature that suggests that um and uh are actually very, very positive features in our speech. Now, I'm not saying that they're positively perceived because that's clearly not true, right? We don't like them. But this is a case, a perfect example of where linguistic reality and social preferences do not meet. So sometimes we have features that arise in our, feet, our speech to meet needs that we have as speakers of a language. And those can be cognitive needs in terms of what's preferred in a structure linguistically. It can be social needs in terms of how, what, how communication and connect, connections can be made more effectively. And then sometimes we have needs that arise because of social preferences that have developed in uh, the world around us in businesses and schools that tell us to do something a certain way. Sometimes those are in tandem and we can get the same benefit from using the thing that's linguistically preferred and the thing that's socially preferred. Sometimes they're in opposition and that's exactly what has happened with filled pauses. Filled pauses come up because we're doing heavy cognitive retrieval. So it's basically a signal that our, head, our, our brain is working overtime. And usually this happens when we're processing more difficult or new information. So we have basically ne more neural firings that are needed when we have, we're hearing something new for the first time than when we hear something many, many times over. And a great example of how integrating new information takes more cognitive effort and causes us to pause more, or fill, fill our pauses more, is a study that was done where they had people look at a picture and describe the picture. And then they would have them describe the picture over and over again. What you find is in their first description of the picture, they use a much higher filled pause rate than in their third description of the picture because they're not doing as much cognitive processing because they've already explained it. They've already gone through the stages in their head. They know what they're going to say. They've built the sentences. They've come up with the vocabulary. There's not much effort involved. But when they're working harder, they're coming up with new words. They're using infrequent words. They're constructing long sentences. They're making in sort of embedded phrases in a different sentence. All of those actually take additional co cognitive effort. And that is where we see ums and uhs come into play. So the idea that ums and uhs are tied to anxiety is really not well established. What it seems to be more tied to is hard cognitive effort. Um, and that often comes up in cases where we might also be anxious, which is why I think people conflate those two. So when we're giving a presentation, that usually involves bigger words than we usually use, familiar, less familiar words than we usually use, because you don't talk at home like you do at the office or in a business presentation. And you're, you're using bigger sentences, right? Because you're probably not taking a lot of background information for granted like you would when you talk among friends and you're building out bigger syntactic structures. Well, it also is a nerve wracking experience to be giving a public presentation. And therefore, yeah. it seems like we're umming and eyeing because we're nervous, but actually we're umming and eyeing because we're doing really heavy cognitive work. Uh, so now people do have rates of ums and uhs. So some people do them a lot, some people do them less. And that does seem to be a kind of personal attribute. I mean, certainly it is true that heavy ummers are generally less well received than light ummers. But the reality is, we um and uh as a speaker for a couple of reasons, but one of them is basically we're doing heavy cognitive retrieval and so we're that's giving us a moment to get our thoughts together it's helping us retrieve the vocabulary out of a sea of other vocabulary words that would come to mind more quickly so if you're using a less familiar word what's going to come to mind more quickly are the more familiar words so you have to kind of wade through that cognitively to get to that word that's less familiar um, and so that's why oftentimes have you ever been in a place where you're trying to come up with a word you're like um um uh, uh it's because your brain yeah, totally. is like marking, marking, yeah. marking. I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. But why we fill our pauses with a sound, because we could just take a, a silent pause, seems to be because not only are we thinking harder, but we want to signal to our listener that they need to give us a moment to come up with what we're going to say and don't take our turn from us. So it's sort of a communicative aid that tells someone that's listening to you, 
I have something more to say. So, you know, don't go away and don't jump in my conversation. You know, don't don't steal the floor from me, which is why when you're talking either to Siri or Alexa or one of a computer or you're talking in a context where you're telling a story and you wouldn't expect to get interrupted, we don't see filled pauses come up as often. So the same speaker will decrease the rate of filled pauses in context where floor theft is not an option compared to Mm -hmm. when they're in a casual conversation. Hey everyone, just want to take a second and thank the sponsor of today's episode, Masterclass. Now, I wanted to share Masterclass with everyone here. I just discovered it. It's an amazing streaming platform with over 180 classes taught by some of the world's best minds. So I'm talking about learning how to cook from Gordon Ramsay or diving into writing with Neil Gammon or even getting tips on tennis from Serena Williams. But what caught my attention was Alexis Ohanian's class on building your startup. Now, I'm a huge fan of the Reddit story. I'm an entrepreneur myself. I could not resist checking it out. And let me tell you, I was blown away by the depth of knowledge and the quality of the experience. See, he shares valuable insights and advice from his own journey as a co-founder and venture capitalist. And the best part is, I didn't have to watch the entire class in one sitting. So I can pace myself. I could explore it when I had time, even just learning something new in 10 minutes. See. Masterclass is perfect for anyone looking to learn from top-notch instructors across a wide range of topics. It's super convenient too as you can access the classes on your phone, your web, literally anywhere, plus each class comes with additional resources. So downloadable guides, class materials, it all enhances the learning experience. So I highly recommend you check it out. You get unlimited access to every class and as a Success Story podcast listener, you get up to 35% off for Mother's Day. So go to, that is masterclass.com slash success story to get up to 35% off for Mother's Day. So really, what are you waiting for? They gave us a special code. You got to go to Masterclass today. Take advantage of this special Mother's Day discount. Happy learning. Is that is that a, an exclusively North American or English feature? And, and the reason why I ask, because you mentioned that that other cultures were more comfortable with silent pauses Mm -hmm. so like like Finns or or i think you mentioned a japanese before they're comfortable with silent pauses would they still have these ums and they do now that so what's interesting is what you're talking about are silent pauses between turns which we call turn transition cues and those are actually different so think about when you come to the end of a sentence you don't usually go yeah so i had a great time at that party uh Right. That's not that's not what you say to tell someone it's their turn to no. talk. Right. So what we're talking about, actually, when I say that is that that space that comes between conversational turns and it serves as a turn transition cue, which tells someone else, oh, it's your turn to talk. Right. Um, and that's what I was talking about in that context. But yes, the, to answer your question more directly, every single language ever studied has filled pauses. And not only do they have one filled pause, but every language studied so far has more than one filled pause, generally at least two. Like Japanese, for example, has a an ano, as well as several others. And um, Dutch has e uh, and m, right? French has e uh, and m. So you have all these filled pauses. Now, the reason the Indo-European languages sound very similar is that actually we hypothesize that they all, or those, those filled pauses probably all originated from a source language. So for example, all Germanic languages have essentially the same two pauses, uh, and um, mm-hmm. slightly different with the vowels based on whatever vowel context that language has. But that suggests to us that they're inherited from Proto-Germanic, which probably got them from Indo-European which is like why French has very similar because it's an Indo-European language, even though it's not a Germanic one. So yes, all languages do have them. They seem to serve the same purpose. And the reason they seem to have two is really fascinating because we don't tend to think there's a substantive difference between uh and um. And if you think about it, why would we need synonyms for a filled pause, which is just sort of a thing that we insert in our speech? It seems kind of odd, but If you look at the length of the pause that people have after they uh, compared to the length of the pause that people take after they um, we find a statistical difference between them so that uh signals you just need a quick sec, um signals you need to take longer. So it actually seems to be listener directed so that listeners will know how long they have before you're going to finish your thought. So a lot of times if I uh, we find that people try to, don't try to fill in what we're struggling with. So have you ever been talking to someone that's I, I mean, a lot and you're like, wait, do you mean this? Do you mean that? 
Well, what's interesting yeah. is if you hear them, uh, because you know it means they're not having as much difficulty, it's not going to take them as long, you don't tend to do that to the same degree. If you um, someone is more likely to try to hop in and help you because that signals to them you're struggling more with whatever you're processing. So there's a really huh. interesting, fascinating difference between the amount of times we, uh, the amount of time we need for an uh versus an um. And the, the final fascinating fact about your filled pauses, because there are so many, is that not only do they help you as a speaker when cognitive processing and communicating a lag or a speech delay, they really help you, studies show, as a listener in both being quicker to process what someone says, integrate new information faster, and remember it better later. So not only do your uhs and ums help you signal to a listener like, okay, they're going to take a minute, but that listener upon hearing those seems to take it as a cognitive flag that whatever follows the filled pause is more, is more difficult to process. That seems to cue their, in, their interest and their cognitive effort towards it. So they get kind of more neural firings directed towards that, which makes them quicker to anticipate what you're going to say and predict it, quicker to integrate new information if it's something novel in that context. And then it also seems to then cement it in their memory better so that if you give them, for example, a pop quiz an hour later, they'll remember words that had an uh or an um before them better than they remember words that didn't. So if you think about it, that's pretty damn impressive for uh, something we think of as bad habits, right? Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's it's exceptional. I've, I've never thought about it this much before. <laughs> this is amazing. Let's, can, we, can we talk about profanity? And, and I want to understand its place in language and communication. So what is the, the psychological impact or what is the psychological reasoning why people swear? Uh, well, you know, there have been, I, I don't study profanity myself, but I have read some of the literature um, on why people do it. And there seems to be sort of an emotional response that it's helping us process when we use profanity. So for the same reason that we um, express ourselves in different ways linguistically when we switch between um, saying something with a more formal context and saying something informal, that's actually doing something for us from a socio-cultural kind of perspective. When we swear, it seems to be something that helps us feel better. It's helping us express an emotion, an emotional reaction, just in the same way, like it's encoding an emotion in the same way that, oh, is encoding of surprise. So if I say something like, oh my God, listen to this, that yeah. oh is actually an exclamation that's encoding, this is surprise here. This is an emotion of surprise that I'm expressing, I'm having, and I want you to share it, right? And so we actually find that my understanding of what we find with swearing is it comes from a different side of the brain that processes emotion and response. And so it is actually a way to help us process these emotions that we're feeling, usually anger or frustration or something like that. And mm -hmm. what's really fascinating about swearing is, of course, you know, it's really much more prevalent today than it was in, you know, something like the 1920s when it wasn't widely accepted. Yeah. But we see an uptick in, in bad words or bad language, you know, obscenities after World War II. And it seems like what happened is when soldiers went overseas and experienced probably the worst things they ever experienced in life, profanity offered them a way to process those experiences, to commiserate over those experiences, to express exactly how deeply it affected them. And they brought profanity home. So they, they had those experiences, they brought it home. And that's where we see actually women start to use it at a higher rate because their husbands came home. They were using profanity. They were describing experiences that were highly emotional. And profanity helped emphasize the intensity of that emotion. And so then it became more prevalent in people's speech every day when they also wanted to express an intensity of emotion. So I know I know you don't study this. So if you if you if you don't have the literature on it, then that's fine. But I'm I'm very curious if if swearing profanity. You mentioned that it's mostly for the person who's actually speaking. It's not for the recipient. It, there's no correlation between profanity and and level of trustworthiness or level of of authenticity and delivery of message. Like I'm thinking of like the Gary V's of the world that swear casually. Right. You know, and he stands behind that fully. I'd be interested. I, I don't know the literature on that. Um, sort of, you're talking about sort of perceptual response to swearing. My my Correct. my suspicion would be it would depend on context, right? It wouldn't be equivalently perceived well in or more trustworthy 
in different contexts. Um, so, you know, if you swear in a professional place where more traditional norms are what are considered appropriate, then I doubt that it would make you feel more trustworthy because it would be a violation of corporate culture in that context, right? And the expectation would be you understand the corporate culture here and you understand that that's inappropriate versus maybe in Silicon Valley where it's much more laid back, that would come across as a more authentic self. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I actually think that it would depend on the context you're studying it in. But I just from what I know about other things about how informal speech tends to make you more sort of sociable and credible, in many contexts, because if you over, use overly stiff or more formal language, it comes across as learned and high status, but also can be kind of arrogant, pretentious. And when we get into more informal speech, it feels more trustworthy, more like this is a person I know, this is a friend, that profanity could operate the same way. But I don't know the literature on that. Um, if I find any, though, I'd be happy to send you something. I, I would do a whole show on that. That's fascinating. No, I just find it fascinating because even I, I, I think to myself and you know when I swear and it's not always it's not always emotional so I'm trying to figure out why I would do it why I would why, why I would say it in a, in a in a sentence that has you know consciously no emotion attached to that sentence maybe there is subconsciously I don't know well, I think but it's it seems like there's not so a lot of times what we do is we have something that is born in one circumstance so swearing came from an emotional core emotional response and it was in response to that we did it at first but a lot of times what we find with language is these these things that language has come to represent then get picked up and moved to a different context that is more metaphorical or figurative. Mm. So uh, O, for example, is a metaphorical extension of surprise. Does that make sense? That you've taken from an explanation yeah. to use it in a word, you know, as a sort of discourse marker that's telling your listener, hey, this is where we're going to shift to something that is new information that you didn't know and it should surprise you, right? You're giving them a heads up about it. So it's already a figurative use of something that was once just an exclamation of surprise when you know someone jumps out of a closet at you so that again is a is a, a good example of where swearing could have that same thing swearing mainly became something that was sort of an expression of intensity um, and surprise and shock whatever and that now is sort of used for emphasis and intensity removed from its original use in more conversational speech. So that would be something that would be very, very normal. And in fact, intensification in general comes from that kind of space. So when we say things like he's very good or terrifically awesome or um, totally great, mm -hmm. the reason we have those words is to express intensity or emphasis. And in fact, those words are called adverbial intensification. That's what we call it. But most words that serve as intensifiers started as something else that had a different meaning that got semantically bleached down um, to meaning just extremely. So very, for example, is uh, originally from a word that meant actual or true. So in Old English, you would find people, well, actually it would be Middle English because it came from French, but in Middle English early on around 1300, you would see references to Jesus as the very prophet which meant the true prophet. He was the true prophet. But later on, about a century later, you start to see it, it as he was a very proper fool, which is actually a quote from Chaucer. And that mm. means he was a true proper fool, which means he had all the qualities of being a proper fool, which is an intensification of being a proper fool. So what over time happens is the meaning of true gets bleached out and all that's left of very is that it means a lot. So I'm very happy means I'm extremely happy. It doesn't mean I'm true. It means I'm very happy. Um, but we can still see very retaining some aspects of that meaning when we say on this very spot, he died, which means on this true or exact spot. Um, so I do, so what I'm sort of the example I'm using this for is that this one sense of very got extrapolated and became the prominent use of very today. I feel like profanity could have worked the same way. This emotional sense of what a word meant in one context, this emphatic and sort of intensity that when you said a cuss word, it brought into the context, got extrapolated. So now when I say, damn, I'm happy, what I'm not saying like, I'm having this emotional experience, it's like I'm intensifying my happiness, right? So it's again extrapolated to the context from its original use, but it no longer carries that same original emotional intensity. Does that make sense? It makes it makes a ton of sense. I have one more. I have one more question. Um, 
and it's we're actually moving away from profanity and we're moving away from longer time periods. I'm curious about accents. I'm curious. I don't know if this is your specialty at all. I'm just throwing stuff on you now. I'm just hoping you answer. <laughs> I love it. So, Give me, so bring it, bring it. I'm, I'm, I'm so curious. So when you look at uh, someone and they're, 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 they came from one country to anov- another country and say they moved from anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world to the U.S. And over their lifespan, they've started to sound, quote unquote, American, you know, and but this, another person will move to the U.S. and their entire lifespan, they'll have an accent from wherever they originally came from. Why is that? <laughs> well, and why is that even I'll give you an even better example, even in, you know, so my girlfriend, she has two sisters. My girlfriend has a little bit of an accent. Her two sisters have no accent. Very, they're all very confused. Are they, young, how the are hell they younger that or happened. older than she is? They're younger. Okay, that's your trick. So I actually, this is my specialty. I do a lot of work. I'm a sociophonetician, which means I do a lot of work on speech sounds and why they come to be and how they work cognitively. And there are a number of things that enter into the question that you asked about why some people have stronger accents than others and what accents are. We're basically, an accent is related to speech sounds. So when we talk about someone's accent, the only thing that actually means is they have a sound to their speech that's uniquely identifying them as being from somewhere else or something different. Uh, A fallacy is that we don't have an accent. We do, because if we go somewhere else, they'll say, oh, you're an American. It's because of your accent. We just don't hear it because we're talking to other people that sound the same way. So what happens is when you have a language that's not English, mostly they have different systems of sounds typically in the vowels. So English is an extremely vowel promiscuous language, which means we just pop vowels out everywhere. You know, we have a ton of vowels in English. It's not ideal, which is why we have a lot of stuff going on with our vowels in American English. They're changing a lot. But if you look at the majority of other languages, they have around five vowels. So for example, Spanish has five vowels. So what happens when you go from a five vowel system to a 13 or 14 vowel system, which is what English is? And I say 13 or 14 because it depends on the dialect of English you're speaking. Well, you have to come up with something for those vowels. So you then say the vowel in your system of those five vowels that's closest to one of those 13 vowels, which then makes you sound different because you're not using the same vowel as someone that speaks that language. So a lot of times accents are deeply tied to vowel pronunciation because that tends to be something that really differs among different cultures, um, among different languages. So the trick is the reason we have certain sounds is because we've learned those as babies, as infants. We find that children are able to recognize the sounds of their language by a year old. So at six months, they don't seem to notice. They notice human speech sounds opposed to other sounds, but they they will equally devote attention to every speech sound, no matter whether it's in their language or not. Um, But, so TH is a good example of the sound, the the sound, the. English is -hmm. is unusual in having that sound. Many, many languages don't. So for example, my mother's a French speaker. She still says one, two, twee, because French doesn't have a (laughs) the sound. So a baby, an English baby will understand both the and ta at six months. And so would a French speaking baby. But by a year old, a French speaking baby will filter out the the sound because it's not relevant to their language. Whereas an American baby will still pay attention to it and suck harder. That's how we measure baby attention. They'll suck harder on a sort of electronic pacifier that transmits their sucking rate to a computer when they hear that sound, meaning they're recognizing that that's part of their speech sound. Then they start babbling. You know, if you've had a baby or been around babies, they do weird things with their mouths and they're like, bah, 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 pa, pa, ta, ta. And they make a lot of noises. That is them actually practicing to make those sounds. So they're exercising their sort of physiological ability to make certain sounds. And like anything with practice, the more you do it, the better you get. But if you don't do something, learning a new skill, no matter what it is, is hard and it takes time. And we're often very good at the things we learn from being a very at a young age and bad at the things we learn at a later age. Well, that's exactly what happens with speech sounds. You have been practicing and setting your articulatory mechanism to make these particular speech sounds since you were born. But all of a sudden you come into a language as an adult or an older adolescent and you have a whole bunch of new sounds that you haven't processed before cognitively, you haven't practiced physiologically, um, and you kind of use your own system to understand that language and that prohibits you in some ways from adopting that language as a native speaker. So that's sort of the background. 
The question you asked is why are some people better than others? Well, some of us are better at doing the analysis as an older adult on sort of the new distribution of sounds. And we just find certain people do that better. And that's partially tied to motivation. It depends on your motivation mm-hmm. for doing it. Um, it often depends on how close or distant your own system was from the one you're learning. But it, it often seems to depend on whether how well you perceive sounds, how well you sort of analyze the statistical distributions. And that just seems to be blind luck. Cause like some people are good at it. Hmm. Some people are less good. The same way that people are good at hearing music or not, like tonality of music. So it does seem to be yep. there's some innate predisposition that makes you better or worse at it. But the key is age of acquisition. The older you are when you're exposed to a new system, the worse you tend to be at acquiring it. So I would suggest that with your girlfriend, because her sisters are younger, they had earlier exposure and longer to adjust to it at an earlier age. And that really seems to make a big impact um, on how language is learned and how accents are gotten rid of. I love this. Okay. Um, so let's 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 wrap this up. Uh, I, I want to give the floor over to you. So I guess two, well, I, I always ask a question at the end, but I'll say that for a second. Um, two things, anything else that you wanted to go into or teach over to uh, the audience that we haven't gone into, feel free. And then also, uh, more importantly, um, what can people get out of your new book? Where can they go get it? And all of your social and, and whatnot. Okay. Well, so I think, uh, you know, the Big thing is everything we've talked about, though a lot of it wasn't directly from the book, although some of it was like the ums and uhs and the intensifiers and things, but uh, it's all about these questions that we have as speakers of human language. I don't think there's anybody alive in any language that has never questioned their own speech or the speech of other people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's not just because we're judgmental. It's because we are indoctrinated into a really firm belief about what's good language and what's bad language. and. Um, the problem is it's it's a, an issue of equity, for one, because we tend to judge certain people's speech as better, and there's reason socio-historically for that. But it's also of accuracy, because a lot of the what we believe about language and the why people do it and what's bad is based on erroneous facts. So it will blow your mind where a lot of these speech features come from. So for example, like... Where does it come from? Well, Valley Girls, right? If I asked you, you'd probably say, oh, it's Southern California, it's Valley Girls. Eh, wrong. It is actually centuries old. If we look back in the 1700s to British trial transcripts, which because obviously we didn't have recordings, we have to rely on transcripts. There is something called the Old Bailey Proceedings, which were criminal trial proceedings that were rigorously transcribed verbatim for about 200 years. So if we look back in the 1700s in Britain, we find like used as a discourse marker. Uh, We also find it in literature at that time. But if you look in New Zealand at some recordings, New Zealand did this wonderful project called, I think it was called the Ons Project, done in the middle of the 20th century, where they recorded really old New Zealanders before they died, um, who had come over from British backgrounds in the late 1800s. So these were people born in the late 1800s. Guess what they used? Like. Just like we use it today at the beginning of sentences um, for cohesion. We also find in octogenarian rural speakers in Britain, they use like the same way. So this is actually a British feature. And it wasn't until it got noticed with Southern California Valley girl speakers in the the 1980s that we all of a sudden were like, oh my God, like is everywhere. It's all, it's a bad thing. But actually it is centuries old and it has fascinating reasons for why it emerged. So it's really about accuracy. If you really want to know why people do this, it's easy to dismiss them, but then you'd miss the reality of why people change language and have through centuries. And my book is really about getting to understand why we do the things we do in language. Um, It's also really funny. I I have fun with it. I want people to enjoy reading it. It will help you understand your kids if you have teenagers. It will help you understand your employees if you have young employees. And it will help you understand yourself if you use any type of non-standard speech marker in your speech. So if you say like, if you use vocal fry, if you um and uh, if you ever said dude in your life, if you're struggling with singular they, any of those things, you can find that in the book. I love it. Okay, where do they go? What's the socials that you want to send people to in the website? Okay, well, my website will have information on other things I've written um, and as well as the book. So that's just ValerieFriedland.com. And I'm sure you'll have the link in your um, show notes so that I don't have to spell that out because it's, of course, uh, a little tricky to spell. But <laughs> that has a lot of information. I also write a monthly blog for Psychology Today. So it's called Language in the Wild. 
you can just either go to my website to find it or if you search Valerie Friedland Psychology Today, it'll come right up. Um, and I pick fun things like swearing. There's actually an, uh, one on swearing, so I'll have to send you that link. Uh, so yes, that's where they can find me. I don't do a lot on social, but you can find me at tw- on Twitter. Uh, Friedland Valerie is my handle there and also on LinkedIn. Okay, perfect. All right. So last question I ask everyone before we, we end this out. Um, you've had an incredible career. Uh, you're writing books. You're, I mean, you've taught at multiple universities. Um, very, very impressive. After everything that you've achieved in your life, what does success mean to you? Oh, you know, that's a really great question because it's something I have t- thought about a lot in the last few years as I've sort of evolved in terms of what I'm doing in my career. And I think if you'd asked me 20 years ago when I f- was first starting out, I would have said financial success. You know, that's what, of course, every 25-year-old is thinking when they're going on the job, right? I want to do something that's cool and I want to have money. I want to be successful. That's success, I think, for a lot of young people. Maybe some people are better than me and don't think that, but that's probably what I thought of in my 20s. But as I've gotten older and wiser and also done more work, what I realize is freedom to me is really the ultimate success, the freedom to pursue the things you like and not have to do the things that really you don't like. Because half of what you do, no matter whether it's some a job you love or a job you hate, is something you don't enjoy about that, right? So for me, it was administration. I'm a professor. And I, I really do enjoy teaching. Um, I'm still close friends with students I've had 20 years ago because I try to be meaningful in their life in some way and I really try to support them because I think mentorship is really key. So it's to me, that's a really valuable part of my job. I love to write. I love to share what I learn. It's a passion for me because I find it so fascinating. I think everybody else has to be also fascinated by this. So those are the things I like. But I've also had to do a lot of administration. Like I hate forms. I hate them. If I have to fill out another form or write a report or oversee somebody or, you know, give lessons and lectures to students behaving badly or professors behaving badly, both of which I've had to do um, because I was a director of the department for a while. I don't like that. I really I did it because it was my civic responsibility and it was what it meant to be in a career like I was in. But I, I felt really awful in that phase of my life. I did six years as a director. And while I had cherished moments and experiences in that, I will say it's not what I like to do at all. Now that I'm a full professor and I'm kind of at the ending stage of my career and sort of seniority, I get to do what I love, which is write and teach. And I don't have to do nearly as much administration. And so to me, I think the freedom to pursue my interests rather than my obligations has really been success in the last few years. 